And all God's people said? Uh, it's great to be with you today. If you have your Bibles, you can open, up, open them up to 2 Timothy. Pull it out. 2 Timothy, if you don't know where that is, it's kind of near the end of your Bible. 2 Timothy chapter 1. We're actually going to be kind of bouncing around chapter 1 and chapter 2, so having your Bible open would be helpful because you can just flip a page. Uh, if you don't have a Bible, uh, just pull out your phone and Google uh, 2 Timothy uh, chapter 1 and just try to do the best you can to stay with us. For those of you who have been in a long time, maybe this is your first time back in, in January, we're going to be jumping back into Matthew here in a, a few weeks. For those of you who maybe are new to us as a church in January, we've actually been walking through the gospel of Matthew verse by verse for about two years now. Uh, <laughs> That's actually, you're laughing, it's true. We started in January 2019. Uh, we're in the middle of uh, chapter 18. We are gonna dive back into that in a few weeks, but there's just some times where I just feel led by the Lord uh, to kind of take a time out from whatever book we are walking through uh, and just address something I think is really important for people within the church to either be reminded of or even for some to learn for the first time. So today, we continue a series we started a few weeks back entitled The Call to Discipleship. If you're a follower of Jesus, as we unpack this series, every one of us has been called to this process called discipleship. Now, real quickly, because discipleship is a real churchy word, a lot of people don't really know what it means, let me just take a moment to show you how we at River City Christian, using scripture holistically, define discipleship. Discipleship is taking on the life of another, uh, and what we mean by that is it's sometimes formal, sometimes informal, but it's the idea that that you are intentionally allowing people to pour into your life as you intentionally pour into the life of people around you, around the Word of God, around prayer, around service, really for the purpose so that people can come to Christ and become more like Him. So we pour into each other's lives, helping them learn to see Jesus as Savior and Master. Again, if you're a follower of Jesus, we're all called to this process. Now in the series, the first week we looked at the cost, what are the sacrifices involved in becoming Jesus' disciple? Listen, salvation is free, no doubt, a gift of God. But discipleship, it's not always easy, and it does come off at some trade-offs. There are some things that we value that we may give up uh, and let go uh, because we value becoming more like Jesus more highly. It's more important to us. Last week, we looked at the why. Why should we enter into the process? And it really just comes down to the reason why is because we love God. And the number one way you love God, Scripture says, is to obey Jesus. The number one way that we obey Jesus is to love people. And the number one way we love people is through discipleship, sharing with them our faith and helping them become more like Christ. So this morning, I, I wanna take some time uh, to really look at the core of discipleship because as I ended last week, I think there was a lot of people thinking, yeah, that sounds good, looks good on paper, I'm in, but maybe we're full of anxiety, maybe even fear, uh, you know, because I don't know where to start, I don't know what that looks like, that is a really churchy concept, I don't even know uh, what I should be doing. And so this morning I want to look at what it really is because I think one of the main reasons why people don't do it is because they don't know what it is, therefore they fear it. Because oftentimes in life when there's a lack of understanding, we feel that we fill that void with fear. So my goal this morning is to fill that void, what is discipleship with understanding, so hopefully we can drive out fear. Now as many of you know, just right around the corner are the Olympics. Uh, I like the Summer Olympics more than I like the Winter Olympics, mainly because we as Americans are better at the Summer Olympics <laughs> than the Winter Olympics. But I, I do like them both. I was reading an article just a little bit ago that, that, that as I read it, I, I realized why I love the Olympics so much, even though kind of like between the four years, I pay pretty much no attention to any of the sports that are in the Olympics. Like the Winter Olympics were four years ago, and I can't tell you the last four champions of the curling uh, championship, <laughs> right? But in a few weeks, I'm gonna be able to tell you who won curling. In the last four years, I can't tell this is a real event, last year, who was the world champion of the snowshoe and target shooting event. I can't believe that's an Olympic event. But in a few weeks, I'm gonna be able to tell you who is the champion of that. I love the Olympics because it just really brings together two of my favorite things, the competitive nature in sport and patriotism. I love America. It's one thing to root for the Raiders, but to root for Americans, I love it. It just seems to bring us all together. The crazy thing about Olympics, we as Americans, 
Even Niner and Ram fans can root uh, for somebody together. It brings us all together. Now, the, the reason why I'm saying that, I'm gonna be this morning to make my point using the 400 meter relay race. Now, if you don't know what the 400 meter relay race, let me bring you to planet Earth in 2020. <laughs> it's four people, each one run 100 meters, and then they pass a baton and then they finish the race by passing that baton. Now, as you may know, the relay race is not necessarily won by the team that crosses the finish line first, but it's won by the team whose last runner crosses the finish line first, carrying the baton, passing it to each person along the way by the rules, because if it's not done correctly, a team can be disqualified, which, if you know, happened to the 1988 American team, which was like the fastest team ever to be assembled. And they didn't even get out of the preliminaries. They didn't make it to the finals because between the third and fourth man, there was a bobble. And when it was finally passed, it was outside the zone. And even though they finished first, they were disqualified and didn't make the finals. Now, this is not a perfect analogy of what I want to share this morning. I'm talking about passing on the baton of faith. Now, when we pass on this baton of faith to somebody, we don't pass it to somebody and then sit back and watch them. We pass it to them and actually start running beside them as they pass it on to somebody else and we keep passing it on to other people. That's one crazy race, right? The point though is I just want us to see the visual of discipleship. It's a visual that we pass on this thing called faith to somebody else, discipleship. Because that's what we see between the Apostle Paul and Timothy's lives in scripture. So let's go to 2 Timothy 1.3. We're gonna be jumping around those first two chapters a bit. Paul writing to his disciple, Timothy, for 2 Timothy 1.3 says this, I thank God whom I serve as my forefathers did. So in this verse right off the bat, he's saying, I thank God for those who ran the race well before me, who intentionally passed it on down to me. Which by the way, this is a really crazy thought to think that Jesus intentionally passed this thing on to his disciples, who then passed it on to other people who then passed it on to other people. And if you're a follower of Jesus today, you are actually part of this chain that goes all the way back to Jesus because over the last 2,000 years, there have been people who took this seriously and passed it down to other people. Now, what does he mean by forefathers? Well, I, he's talking about the Jewish ancestors of his faith who kept passing on their faith until it came to him. But we do know that after Paul received Christ, he didn't directly go into ministry. It wasn't like that vision he had on the road to Damascus, Jesus called him to be his servant, that he just turned around and started teaching the gospel. That's not what happened. In fact, he went to a city called Antioch and spent time with other followers of Jesus and we've learned that he actually spent some time with the apostles who were really discipling Paul. That although he was incredibly intelligent, they were discipling him because they had been with Jesus. So Jesus poured into the disciples. They in turn pour into Paul. Now look at 2 Timothy 2.5. So flip to chapter 2. 2 Timothy 2.5, as the chain continues, says, I have been reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice. The inference is it's been passed on. And I am persuaded now lives in you also. So the disciples pass this baton of faith to Paul. Paul then shows up to Lystra, shares his faith, pouring in the lives of people there, passes this baton to Timothy's grandmother who passed it on to his mother, which in turn passed it to Timothy. So this letter that we're reading is Paul's challenge to Timothy to not stop the chain. Don't stop passing this faith on. Look at 2 Timothy 2.1. This is the core of the entire letter. 2 Timothy 2.1. Paul writes, you then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Another way to say that is Jesus will empower you to do what I'm calling you to do. What is he calling him to do? Verse two, this is what you need to do. And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses and trust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. Now, when we hear that idea of teach others, we think of a guy like me standing in front of a group of people. That's not usually what it meant biblically. Biblically, it was the idea of really pouring into the life of people around you. So the challenge is, Timothy, pass on the baton of faith 
To who? Reliable people, meaning people who won't just listen and walk away, but people who will take it and then pass it on to others, who will then pass it on to others. A phrase that we use kind of in modern Christianity is we are to make disciples who make disciples who make disciples who make disciples. Now, let me give you a background to this letter, why he's writing it. Timothy is struggling with his faith, and because of his struggles, Timothy's actually thinking of quitting. He's discouraged. He feels inadequate. He's facing a whole lot of roadblocks to discipleship, and so passing on this idea of faith to others, he's kind of like, I don't know if I want to do this anymore. Now, what are the things that he's facing? One, he's separated from Paul. So for years, Paul was in Ephesus, and Timothy was alongside of him, where Paul really did the majority of the work. But now he's there by himself doing it, and he feels a bit... um, by himself lonely. Secondly, Paul, who he loves, is in a Roman prison cell. If you don't know, Paul spent two big stints in prison uh, with Rome. The first one was actually like under house arrest. He was in a home, people can visit him, he had great food. It was not that big of a deal, if you will. The second one, when he writes Timothy, though, he's actually in a prison cell in which he will never be released. So he's been following Paul's taillights, sometimes closely, sometimes it's been far away, but those taillights are about to disappear, and Timothy's afraid. Thirdly, this is in the early 60s AD. If you know anything about history, it's about this time that the Roman Empire was having some difficulties around the world, many of them economic, and many people were blaming Nero, the emperor at the time, and Nero, the ultimate narcissist, was like, it can't be my fault, and so he started blaming other people, and one of the big targets was the Christians. It's their fault. And so this is why Paul was thrown into prison. And so in Ephesus, Timothy's leading a church that's starting to face great persecution. We also know Timothy's actually having some health issues. In the first letter, we find out that he has some kind of chronic stomach issue. We don't know what it is, but everyone here knows that life is difficult. But when you're having health issues, it just makes life even more difficult. So everything he's faced is amplified. And then lastly, Both letters give us the impression that Timothy's just one of those guys that that struggled with courage. There's multiple things that Paul says in these letters, such as God has not given us the spirit of timidity, but the spirit of power. He says multiple times, do not be ashamed of the gospel, be strong in his grace. And so Timothy wasn't necessarily by nature a bold guy. So you put all those things together and you have a young guy that's absolutely scared to death and he's thinking, I can't do this. I can't make disciples. And maybe that's you. For whatever reason, I can't do that. So the Apostle Paul, writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, encouraging Timothy to stay at it, and in doing so, he answers some questions that I think for many of us, if we know the answers to these questions clearly, it might remove a barrier for you, allow you to get in the game, and see that it's not as complicated as you may think. So what is this baton? Let's start there. What is this thing that we're responsible as followers of Jesus to pass on that God has entrusted to you, not just to enjoy, but to give away. Because I I think for many of us, if I asked you, discipleship, pass it on, I think that's a bit of an ambiguous statement. And because of that absence of understanding, again, fear rises up, and then we, we don't step in. So in this passage, Paul takes some time to describe the baton. He wants Timothy to know, therefore us, what it is, what's at stake, so we'll pass it on. So what is the baton of faith? Well, number one, Paul tells us this thing that we're to pass on, a part of discipleship, number one, is the story of Jesus. We're to pass on the story of Jesus. So going back to the first chapter, 2 Timothy 1.8, Paul says this, do not be ashamed to testify about our Lord. The actual language there says it this way, don't be ashamed to give the testimony of our Lord. So what this is saying is don't be afraid to talk about who Jesus is. Start there. You're wondering what to pass on. Just talk about who Jesus is and how he lived. Listen, there are great mysteries to the gospel that even the the smartest theologians are still wrestling with that don't fully know or understand. But what he's entrusted to us to pass on, what he's asking us to give away, is actually quite simple. It's the story of Jesus. Paul says it this way in 1 Corinthians. People are talking about what's most important. He says, okay, time out. You're getting getting caught up in all the wrong stuff. Of first importance, he says. So put all that stuff aside. Let's focus on what's most important is this. He says in 1 Corinthians 15, that Jesus died for our sins, that he was buried, 
and he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. That's it. That's the story of Jesus. It's about God coming in person in Jesus Christ, taking on human flesh, living a life that we couldn't, laying down his life on the cross so that God's wrath would be satisfied, and then he overcame the grave in order that if we so choose, we can have life with him. That's the story we're to tell. The second thing that we are to pass on out of the story of Jesus is the good news of salvation. Going back to chapter one, the second part of verse eight, after he says, don't be ashamed, he says this, join with me in the suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who has saved us and called us to a holy life. Not because of anything we've done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time, but has now been revealed through appearing of the Savior, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and brought us life and immortality to light through the gospel. Now, very wordy terminology that Paul uses there, but what I want you to, to see is what he's asking him to share, what he's asking them to pass on is actually quite simple. I want everyone here to understand that you don't have to be a great theologian or great speaker to understand that to pass on the good news of salvation is actually quite simple. So let's just talk about that real quickly. I use the Roman road all the time, so I'm gonna share with, it, uh, uh, with you. If you don't know what this is, it's in your notes section. Um, you can just pull it up, it's four verses. And what Paul does, it's a much more complicated as he lays it out in the book of Romans, but he really, he answers three questions. And this is what we're to share. The three questions is what's the problem? What's the solution? What do I need to do? The problem is, it starts off in Romans 3.23, it says all have sinned and fall the short, short of the glory of God. Why is this a problem? The next verse. This is a problem for the wages of sin is death. So what's the problem? We're all sinners and we have to pay for that sin with death, meaning eternal separation from God. That's the problem. Okay, what's the solution? He tells us, Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this, while we were still sinners, that's the problem, I got a solution. Christ died for us, amen? Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? So the problem, we're sinners, and because of that, that's death. The solution, Jesus died for us, so what do we need to do? Romans 10, nine. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it's with the heart that you believe and are justified, and it's with your mouth that you confess and are saved. My friends, it's, it's all you need to understand to be able to pass on this good news of salvation to the people around you. Now, if deeper conversations come, always ask, and we can get deeper into those conversations. But to pass on the good news of salvation, it's just to understand we're sinners in need of a savior. He solved the problem, and if you trust in him, you are saved, amen? amen. Listen, if a seven or eight-year-old can understand and pass this on as I've witnessed, I believe every one of you can do it as well. Now, where do we go from here? What else are we to pass on? The sovereign work of grace, number three. So we, the story of Jesus, how one is saved, and then thirdly, the sovereign work of grace, which is another way to say that now we're in Christ, with his help and others, we become holy. Another way to say it is, how do we begin to live as he's lived? Now, the first two are pretty simple because I think everyone can do it, but yet there, there might be some here, people here right now that, okay, I can do those first two, but I, I need a little help with this third one. See, if you're a baby Christian feeling completely unqualified to do what we're talking about, what I want you to see is you can pass on the story of Jesus and the good news of salvation as you allow others to help you learn what it looks like to live as Jesus lived. And as you learn these things, guess what? You then pass them on to others. It's really important to understand, yes, he has saved us from something, death, but he also saved us to something, holiness. Look at verse 1 9. Jesus, who has saved us, has called us to a holy life. What he is saying is he saved us from the cost of sin, death, but he's also saved us to the life we were created for perfection, the likeness of God, freedom from sin. Listen, the purpose of everything that we do in Christianity, everything that we're called to do in the New Testament, really comes down to either helping people become saved or helping us become holy. 
The things that we're to do as followers of Jesus are not to be saved, but to move towards holiness. Whether that's how to read scripture, how to pray, how to share your faith, how to leave sin behind, how and where we're to serve, the list goes on and on. Which by the way, if you think about these things, how to read the Bible, how to pray, how to share your faith, how, how, how to pursue freedom, how to serve. For the most part, none of us learn how to do those things on our own. So we share the, good, the story of Jesus, good news, now it's about how do we become more like Jesus and when we learn things along the way that help us from somebody else that you are intentionally allowing to pour into your life, you then take those things and share them with other people. The danger is, is people think, well, I, when I get it all together, then I'll start to help others. What's the problem with that? <laughs> you never will get it all together. And if you wait till then, you never will. The reason why it's called the sovereign work of grace, this is so important to understand, is we can't do this stuff humanly anyways. We're just a conduit of his power. These are spiritual issues that run deeper than we can possibly imagine. And because some of us actually understand that it runs deeper than we can imagine, I think we think it's beyond me, I'm unqualified, and so we don't do anything. If I've lost you, catch this one thing. Wake up for this one moment. Right now, God has given you everything you need in order to fulfill your calling to become like him and help others do the same. Right now, you already have everything you need. You know why? If you're a follower of Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit living within you. He is the one that does the work. My friends, the power to transform hearts and change lives does not come from human effort. Transformation, changed lives come from the Holy Spirit through the word of God and through prayer. These are spiritually miraculous things. And so as you use scriptures to give counsel to others, my friends, there is power in that. When you pray for someone to have a heart change, there is power in that. We cannot humanly remove, let's say, lust from someone's heart, but we have the Holy Spirit working through us. And so as we intentionally love, develop relationship, serve, care, talk about scripture with others, pray for others, the Holy Spirit then through us can set people free. Simply put, that's the baton we're called as children of God to pass on. Discipleship. Sometimes it's formal, sometimes informal, but that we're intentionally passing on the story of Jesus, the good news of salvation, and then we're helping others grow in their faith. Now, you might be in that place right now where it's like, okay, maybe I could tell the story of Jesus, maybe I can share the good news of salvation, but man, I, I need some help. I need some help learning how to read the Bible. I need some help learning how to pray. I need some help learning how to serve or what that looks like. Listen, if that's you, my big question is this. If that's you and you care about it, what are you doing about it? Because it won't happen if you don't take a step. I promise. And that's why at this church we take this seriously and we provide a zillion opportunities to step into some form of discipleship from men's and women's groups on Wednesday nights to youth groups on Sunday nights uh, to the college age ministry on Monday nights to growth groups that meet all over the city in people's homes almost every night of the week to Rooted, which starts this next Sunday, January 30th at the 10 o'clock service, which is an incredible on-ramp to this process. But if it's something you want and you don't take a step I promise you it won't happen. It's the old definition of insanity. You've heard it before, right? Insanity is doing the same thing and expecting different results. You gotta take a step. Now, let me end with this. In the meantime, what can we be doing to help this process? What can we be doing to help us be in a place that we can pass it on? Three things, real quickly. Nurture the gospel in your life. The first, the chapter one, verse six says this, 2 Timothy 1, 6. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God. Fan into flame. If you don't tend to a fire, what will always happen? It will always go out. And the same is true of this gift of the gospel God has given you. You have to feed the flame. So yeah, read the word, pray, get in a growth group, take rooted, discover your gifts and start to, to, to serve. We need to continually give our faith fuel to keep it ablaze. 
when we tend to our faith, I'm here to tell you, when we tend to it, one of the ways that it begins to grow is when we put ourselves in a place that God can use you in the life of another person. Without a doubt, for me, the things that, when I feel closest to the Lord is when I'm intentionally using the gifts he's given me for his glory and it makes a difference in somebody else's life. The same is true for you. Secondly, own the gospel. Multiple times in these two letters, Paul says, do not be ashamed of the gospel. Do not be ashamed of the gospel. Do not be ashamed of the gospel. And so you need to own it. And so I would talk to anybody here who's 50, 60 years old, or maybe, maybe some of our youth in the room. At some point in time, this thing called faith has to become yours, not your parents'. At some point in time, it's gotta say, you know what? I'm doing this because I believe it, not just because my parents dragged me to church. At some point in time, it's gotta be your faith. You declare it. Because until you own it, you're probably not gonna be really involved in this process. And then thirdly, live out the gospel. Verse 13 of chapter one, he says, what you heard from me, keep as a pattern. This phrase means so much more than speaking. It's a pattern of life. Let the gospel define who you are, every place you go, every decision you make. For those of you who are married, men, love our wives as Christ loved the church. Live out the gospel. Women, love and respect your husband as he leads the family in the godliness and honestly at times when he doesn't. Parents, raise your kids to love Jesus above all else, including education and then becoming the next Michael Jordan. <laughs> now I'm not saying neglect those things, but make sure gospel takes top priority. Kids, obey your parents. Listen to and respect all authority. Not so much because they're always right, because it's a picture of the gospel. Because as Christ submitted to the Father, when we submit to authority, we display the gospel well to the people around us. It's all part of discipleship, growing in our faith. You know what's interesting about that example I used earlier, that 1988, uh, men's 400 meter relay. The fastest man on earth, anybody remember who it was? Carl Lewis. He didn't run in the preliminary race. You know why? It was actually quite common even to this day when, when countries like the United States have so many athletes, a lot of times they'll take a Carl Lewis who's in many other events, so they'll allow him to do the other events and keep him rested because you can substitute from your team when the finals come. So they're actually saving Carl Lewis for the finals as the fastest man on earth to be the anchor. And he never ran in the race. He never received the baton, if you will, because it wasn't passed well. So my question to you is who has God put in your life to pass this baton on? And if we don't, the big question is who may not receive it? Who might not be able to run this race with us? This is what's at stake. And so my encouragement to you is I hope you can see that this isn't rocket science. It's simple. Fan the, faith, fan the flame of your own faith, live it out, and then do what you can to develop relationships so that you can tell the story of Jesus, share the good news, and help others become more like Christ. Amen? Let's pray. God, thank you for who you are and what you're doing in our life. Help us be a, a biblical church, God. We get so caught up into, into this American Christianity. And I know there's people in this room, Lord, that view their faith with you as just kind of an isolated thing. It's an individual thing, but that's not how you built your kingdom. So God, help us step past, for some of us, giant boundaries of fear to develop relationships with other believers for the purpose of people pouring into our life and so we can pour into others and so that we can display the gospel well. I pray this in the powerful name of Jesus Christ and all God's people said,